Okay, well, thank you. Um, uh, and thank you to the, the uh, committee for inviting us to, to be here. Talking to this audience about how um, seismology can contribute to problems at the Earth's surface is a daunting one indeed. Uh, so like some of the other committees that you've already heard, what we've chosen to do in terms of our structure is to try to focus on what the committee perceives as emerging and exciting scientific disciplines more as illustrative examples of what we can do and rather than just try to sort of list every way in which seismology sort of contributes to the understanding of these coupled systems uh, that operate at the Earth's surface. And so to start, um, I, in searching around for an image that might encapsulate some of this, I guess I, I focused on this one of Alaska, not only because the Earth scope deployment is going up there, but because it illustrates that there are really two fundamental time scales at which surface processes, erosion, tectonics are coupled. Um, at the very longest time scale, we know that the development of topography, right, is a reflection of this interaction between processes in the solid earth and the motion of ice and water and sediment around on the surface of the earth. And then also at the, it, one of the emerging fields, of course, is the application of seismological techniques and investigations to studying the fluxes of material at anthropogenic timescales. So trying to understand the response of the surface to both natural and anthropogenic forcings. And so Sridhar in his talk is going to focus uh, more on the cryosphere and I'm going to touch on a few other pieces of it. Um, I should say that the co-chair of the committee is Sean Gulick. He's on a cruise offshore Alaska and couldn't be here now. Um, and then the other members of the committee at the moment are Sridhar and Kellen Whipple, who's also in the field and was unable to be here. Let's see if I can advance that. Um, the themes we identified, uh, similar to some of the other groups, at the geologic time scale, there's been a long history of trying to study the coupling between erosion and the evolution of uh, orogenic systems. More recently, and one of the topics that I'll, I'll show an example of, is the emergence of a refined understanding of how flow in the mantle might drive long wavelength and low amplitude deformation of the Earth's surface. And then at the short time scale, uh, I want to show a couple examples of some recent attempts to try to understand surface fluxes, in particular of sediment, um, in terms of uh, monitoring change on the Earth's surface. Um, and I guess the, the theme of, in particular, this Science Challenge Committee is that of all of them, one of the themes that we heard this morning was that almost all of these scientific problems, and I think Anne mentioned this, require integration of seismologic techniques with the broader geoscience community. And that is particularly true when we're talking about what happens at the Earth's surface interface. Um, when we think of the interaction between climate erosion and tectonics, this is probably one of the canonical figures that comes to mind. And we've known for 15 or 20 years that the redistribution of mass by erosion acts to modulate the size, the shape, the distribution of strain within mountain belts. It turns out it is much harder to actually demonstrate this in most natural examples, and it evolves partly because these systems have very long response times on the order of millions of years, and it evolves because the challenge of knowing or of isolating a single climatic forcing that operates at the scale of a mountain belt like Taiwan is uh, large indeed. There's going to be uh, some possible uh, ways to approach this as we move into Alaska, um, and we could talk about that in, in, the, uh, in the question and answer session, but 
I want to sort of use as an example of how I think we can, how the surface processes and the seismologic communities can begin to converge on problems. Um, one of the emerging fields that we saw earlier today is that a lot of the science efforts that have been associated with the Earthscope deployment in the Sierra Nevada, in the Rockies, and now in the eastern North America have been focused on trying to isolate the, or to try to isolate the signal of dynamic topography and flow associated with edge confection, with removal of lithospheric mantle, with broad changes in the flow field. And I want to show you an example from the eastern seaboard. Uh, this is from Suzanne Vanderlee, a few years old now, but the tomography that it's pretty well recognized that the deep mantle has a signature that appears to be the Farallon slab descending from beneath Western North America. And then there, the shallow um, asthenosphere and lithospheric mantle have large magnitude variations in wave speed that may or may not reflect convective flow in the mantle um, and potentially dynamic support of topography along the eastern seaboard. A recent effort to try to explore this by Dave Rowley and Jerry Mitrovica, um, published last year, looked at variations in the elevation of a Pleistocene shoreline from south here in Georgia, north into North Carolina. And the shoreline itself, this is data, not model, varies by about 60 meters over you know, wavelengths of several degrees of latitude. And that variation appears to be at least qualitatively consistent with the results of um, dynamic topography that emerges from forward models of uh, density-driven flow in the mantle. Um, and so what you're seeing here on the map is a color-coded change in dynamic topography since about three million years in one realization of a mantle flow model. And uh, these authors were at least found the coincidence compelling that over the same wavelength of two or three degrees of latitude had about the same variation in amplitude of um, apparent deflection of this Pliocene shoreline. Of course, the challenges faced by this community are to try to understand how the finer structure and the Density and the relationship between seismic velocity and density and mantle flow all feed back, particularly with changes in ice loads. Um, and so when one tries to dig deeper back in time, it gets uh, particularly complicated. And so I wanted to show you a very quick example. I'm looking at the clock thinking uh, we're going to have to move on here quickly. But this is uh, some work trying to look at the geomorphology in the Susquehanna River Basin here in Pennsylvania. This is another one of those models from Bob Mucha, and again, now dynamic topography since 30 million years ago. And so over the Appalachians, this model suggests uh, 100, 200 meters of uplift. Um, we've looked at river systems. And so the, uh, this, this map is the geomorphologists being inspired by the seismologists that we too can make red and blue maps. Um, this is actually a map of how steep the river systems are. So this is the gradient of rivers and tributaries in the Susquehanna normalized for differences in drainage area. And what you see is a, a spatial coincidence of very steep rivers up here in sort of northern Pennsylvania. If you look at the erosion rate, so if you go in, you measure the concentration of beryllium-10 in river sands, you can map that into erosion rate. And what we see is a very distinct association of steep rivers here on the, ax on the uh, y axis with high erosion rates here on the x axis. And if you play some games and try to run that relationship back in time, we can actually do a reasonable job of trying to invert for the cumulative amount of uplift through time that's recorded in both the distribution of the river 
systems and in the association between where rivers are eroding quickly. Essentially, we're seeing, we think we're seeing a wave of erosion that's sweeping up from the coast and is somewhere here in the northern Appalachians. And so, you know, this is obviously very much in its infancy, but there is, at least I'm convinced, that we're starting to be able to take the tools of evaluating the topography and relating it to erosion rates and contribute to questions that are, um, or we're able to begin to see back into time um, in terms of trying to understand the forcing that operates on the landscape. Uh, shifting gears um, into anthropogenic time scales, I'm not going to talk about cryosphere processes. I'm going to leave that to the expert uh, who will talk next. But there have been some very promising efforts in trying to use seismological data to directly monitor fluxes of mass, fluxes of sediment at the Earth's surface. Uh, this is a recent example by Brandon Schmatt and um, folks in this room on the Grand Canyon, where through the course of about a four or five day discharge event, a flood event where discharge rises and falls, um, they see, and other groups have seen this as well, a, sort of a hysteresis in the power of and also in the noise associated with transport of bed load sediment, transport of boulders in sediment. And in particular, the, the sort of hysteresis that more of the noise is on the rising limb as well as these spikes, short-lived noisy events, uh, seem to be telling us that there's a signature of bed load transport that we can hear. Um, of course, this is very much in its infancy. Um, there, the quantitative relationships between what the flux is, what the grain size, the caliber, the properties of the rock are all very unknown at this point. Um, but it looks like a promising tool to begin to do remote continuous monitoring of um, transport processes. In a similar way, there's a community that's very interested in understanding fracture generation in rocks. Um, fractures in the shallow subsurface set the architecture of hydrology. They set the architecture of grain size and weathering that's delivered to regolith and eventually becomes a substrate on which we all survive. Um, and the, a number of groups have started to use very basic, very crude seismic techniques to try to evaluate the distribution of fractures in the subsurface uh, where you can't see them. Um, there's a, a whole bunch of opportunities, particularly with the, the NSF-funded critical zone um, observatories but also the National Center for Earth Surface Dynamics to try to better understand that shallow subsurface interface and understand how the fracturing of rock in its relationship to climate, tectonic history, rock type, sets the template on which all this weathering erosion actually acts. Um, and so with that as a, a brief uh, discussion. Looking forward over the next few years, of course, there's going to be a number of opportunities in terms of uh, the deployment of um, Earth scope equipment into Alaska, both at sort of the long time scale, cryosphere tectonic interactions, as well as um, perhaps linkages between subduction zone behavior. Um, there's a lot of science still to come out of the EarthScope data that was collected in North America. I think you'll see more and more of that in terms of the mantle surface connections. And there's going to be a lot coming down the pike, I think, in terms of trying to understand the fine structure and in a predictive way what sets the fracture distributions of the shallow subsurface um, so that these communities that are worried about um, the ecology of the Sierra Nevada can actually um, say something quantitative about that. And just to end, uh, of course, is that this 
is going to require a fairly close connection with disciplines and with programs um, across the geosciences and probably sometimes into the biosciences. So thanks. Did you want to do the PDF? Uh, no, I want you to just say the keynote. Why don't you go ahead and do that? There you go. I'm going to use this. Yep. All right. I guess I'll use the PDF. Go for it. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe not. A little help. Shows up nicely here. <laughs> That's keynote. Oh. No, no, it's PDF. The keynote uh, complained. Oh, did it? Yeah. Okay. There's something about a version. I got the mirror display. So while they're setting up, uh, uh, the committee asked me to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, the cryospheric aspects of of, of how the uh, Irish community uh, is contributing and and could contribute uh, in 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 much increased fashion. Uh, as some of you probably know, uh, uh, polar uh, is a is a very big component of. Uh, 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 of Pascal, of UNAVCO, of many of these facilities, uh, but you might not know the reason for it. So uh, it, some of you are probably fully aware of it, uh, but I, I just want to give sort of a motherhood and apple pie uh, talk about uh, what are some of the uh, uh, sort of driving questions in the cryospheric community uh, that, that uh, you all could really contribute to. Uh, the uh, the, 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 the session is Change Interactions Among Climate, Hydrology, Surface Processes, and Tectonics, uh, which I've uh, put into shorthand as climate to tectonics with the particular part that I'm going to be talking about is the cryosphere in the middle. Uh, and this is uh, – uh, th there are a number of grand challenges, I think ten of them, in that document. And the three that I've pulled out are uh, near-surface effects, uh, ocean atmosphere, cryosphere interactions, and understanding fault stuff. The reality is that the cryosphere fits into almost all of those ten uh, uh, grand challenges in some way or the other, but these are the ones that I'm really going to look at. Uh, and the overall motivation, the driving motivation for this is, uh, uh, from a cryospheric community point of view, is understanding uh, how uh, the cryosphere is impacting sea level. So this is a sea level curve. Can we get rid of this thing? Yes. No, we can't. Um, the, this is a sea level curve over the last uh, century or so, and all of you are familiar with this. Uh, there's been 20 centimeters or, or so of sea level rise o o over this time. Uh, and in the inset, we have uh, uh, a nuclear power plant in the UK, Sizewell B. Uh, there are now uh, plans uh, or discussions in Britain on Sizewell C. Uh, and, and so we, we need to worry about uh, 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 installations near uh, uh, in, in, in coastal communities. Um, the things that contribute to sea level rise are many and varied. Uh, the ones that this community is uh, um, could contribute to to great effect is the contributions from the large polar ice sheets, Antarctica and Greenland. Uh, there are mountain glaciers and and uh, temperature related uh, ocean expansion that also contribute to sea level rise. But what I'll be really talking about is uh, the di dynamic effects due to changes in the mass balance of uh, Antarctica and of Greenland. Um, 
this is a slightly old uh, uh, map. It's from uh, 2007, uh, but, but nevertheless, it, it, it really does contain everything that we're interested in. Uh, the dots, the, the big circles are mass balance, how much more water is going into the ocean uh, if it's a red dot uh, or how much uh, 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 extra ice is being retained in Antarctica if it's a blue dot. And mainly you see red, uh, and that number is only going to grow over the next uh, uh, decades to centuries. Uh, right now, it's a very, very small number. Uh, the two big red dots are under 100 gigatons per year, which is uh, less than half a millimeter per year of global sea level rise. But over the course of the next century, uh, estimates of sea level rise range from, uh, and each of, these, uh, uh, each of these vertical bars over here is a different estimate over the last uh, 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 15 or 20 years uh, from the IPCC, and AR5 is the most recent report, and it has an estimate of sea level rise of something between 20 centimeters and 90 centimeters, and we would like to reduce that uncertainty. Uh, and you see there's a sort of a, uh, a, an artistically fading uh, a line that goes up called Antarctic collapse uh, that is the uncertainty in what happens if you have large changes in the Antarctic ice sheet, uh, which, we're, uh, which uh, we can't um, uh, preclude. And that stretches up, this is over the next century, and that stretches up to close to two meters, possibly, of global sea level rise, which would be uh, 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 just huge. Uh, the way this community arguably could contribute very, very directly to is by uh, allowing glaciologists to better understand something as fundamental as uh, heat flux at the base of the ice sheet. This is something that we just don't know. Uh, uh, Antarctica and Greenland are com completely covered by up to, to uh, three and four kilometers of ice, and so making measurements of heat flux is uh, 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 difficult to, to impossible, and so you have to do it using seismological methods. This is uh, 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 a um, uh, Rayleigh wave inversion uh, of um, uh, uh, shear wave velocities, and that can be converted to temperature, and it's used in, in relatively crude fashion. Uh, East Antarctica is given one number and West Antarctica is given another, but we really need to know that in much, much finer detail uh, if we're going to ever have a hope of turning um, uh, this incredibly important parameter. Heat flux at the base of the ice sheet uh, controls uh, an enormous amount of uh, telling us whether the ice is frozen or thawed, and we need to know that, and we need to know that yesterday. So get working, all of you. Um, the second uh, big motivating uh, theme is going to be ice-ocean interactions. Uh, this is an ice shelf in uh, uh, Pine Island Bay, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it's a dramatic, that's a, probably a, a, a 100 meter or so, um, maybe not quite a 100 meter face over there, and there's big chunks of it that fall off. Uh, and the question is, what are the processes associated with this fracture? And as you all know, the best way, one of the best ways to study fracture is to go and put a lot of seism uh, seismometers around it and, and record it and, and uh, figure out the fault uh, mechanisms and figure out the processes associated with it. This is another fundamental glaciological uh, uh, process that we don't have a handle on. We don't know how ice shelves break apart uh, and, 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 and what rate they do it at. Uh, this is a cross-section through an ice shelf, uh, and it, uh, uh, it has an impressive number of acronyms on there, and uh, I bet you even the authors, if I asked them today what all of those are, wouldn't be able to tell me. But in, in, in short form, warm water comes in from the open ocean on the right, goes into the cavity of the, uh, underneath the ice shelf, and melts the ice uh, at the grounding line, uh, and then that circulation continues. Uh, in order to make that oceanographic model, you need to know what that cavity looks like. And there are very, very few ways to do that other than seismic methods. Uh, you, can send, uh, you can send a 
uh, a submarine, a UAV or something like that under there, uh, and one time out of two, that UAV won't come back. Uh, so uh, so uh, seismological methods are ones that are, are, are uh, incredibly valuable in this because really there's no other way to do it. And this is the uh, big question is how the oceans and the ice shelves, uh, and the ice shelves, and then ultimately the inland glaciers interact. Um, so these are the big questions in ocean ice interactions. Ice shelf calving rates and mechanisms, the geometry, the ocean circulation and temperature structure, and, and there are some very innovative uh, uh, seismological methods for even inverting for temperature and, and temperature structure uh, in, in the oceans, which uh, could have value in this using acoustic methods. Uh, finally, just um, uh, uh, following on on what uh, uh, Eric talked about, uh, this is a, a, a mountain glacier in, uh, uh, or, or a mountainside in, in Greenland, uh, and you have a mile of relief that you can see and another mile that you can't see, and all this was made by glaciers. Glaciers really matter for landscape, and they do it at spectacular rates, uh, anything from meters per year of erosion to zero. Why? What are the, what are the controls on that uh, huge variation, and what are the implications for landscapes? Uh, and I'll just end with a, a very brief look at, uh, at, at, at uh, the largest fault on the world, which is the base of the ice sheet. Uh, there's a glacier on top. There's rock below. Uh, the glacier is sliding over that rock, and you have till, which arguably is fault gouge, and you have uh, 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 stresses there that are driven by the flow of the ice. You have a wonderful fault slip laboratory that we really need to take advantage of. Uh, this is a, a, a plot that um, uh, 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 Peng and Gomberg made recently, and um, if I can use this, yeah. Uh, there are three red, uh, three stars over here, and the stars are labeled uh, uh, Glacier, I believe, uh, and they, the horizontal axis is seismic moment, the vertical axis is duration or rate, and so this is the slow slip uh, uh, range of events, and this is the, quote, regular earthquake range, and the glaciers, uh, those few events that you have sort of span across all of these, and as we put more instruments out, uh, this thing would just turn into a uh, a sea of red stars if, um, if if we had the if we had the data to do that. Uh, here's just one example. Uh, this is seismicity from David Glacier in Antarctica. Uh, this is time in minutes along the horizontal axis. These are two stations. This is a vertical the 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 vertical displacement. And here you have an event and then another event and then another event. And the inner event time is 20 minutes plus or minus a few minutes. And this goes on and on and on for month after month after month. Uh, if you all can explain this, uh, we've tried to do it. And, and uh, it, it's an extraordinary uh, example of, of uh, 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 sort of fault uh, uh, processes. Uh, this is one from uh, Nettleton Ekstrom uh, using uh, uh, or, or detecting climate change with seismicity. So the number of these types of glacial earthquakes changes over time as uh, the oceans around Greenland are warming and as the oceans around Antarctica are warming, you're getting more of these iceberg calving events or, or ice shelf calving events. And then there is um, uh, stick slip. This is, uh, uh, these, these dots are the position of the glacier, and it sits in one spot for a long time, and then jumps forward, and then sits in one spot for a long time, and then jumps forward. And you all have heard me, some of you have heard me talk about this before, but, and I, I would have, be happy to expand on it in, in, in the future. But there's, there's really a lot that IRIS can, can, does contribute and could contribute, continue to contribute uh, uh, to seismology. Uh, and I'll just uh, sort of leave this up here as a um, uh, uh, um, uh, something for you all to, to look at. I think I've covered most of these in, in, uh, in, in the short presentation that I had. I don't want to take up too much of the d discussion time. So I'll turn it back to Eric. <laughs>